Hello, everybody. This is Stuart Wilde. Welcome to the audio version of the Little Money Bible. Introduction. We live in challenging times. Markets have become more volatile. Governments are ever more regulatory and grasping over their citizens' wealth. It's time to review the laws of money. In such changing conditions, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that we live in a very abundant world, that the laws of money and flow are eternal and natural, that nothing has really changed. Abundance is our birthright. Here in this little book, I will reiterate the main laws and principles from my other books on abundance. The trick to money is having some, and life was never meant to be a struggle, and encapsulate them for a fast and easy listen. These are the laws of money. They serve to remind us how to align effortlessly with flow and abundance. Money is energy. Your life is energy. You are a physical body. A personality formed from a collection of memories. But what you are in the end is a feeling. That feeling has a spiritual identity. It is your soul. Money is also a feeling, a feeling of wealth, security, flow, and success. Sometimes money can be a feeling of importance and specialness, a feeling of power. Throughout history, philosophers and great religious leaders. Have taught that there is a divine abundance which ebbs and flows through our lives, as the seasons do. We are loved and provided for. Money is just a symbol of the infinite goodness, the compassion that gave us life. We intrinsically know how to manage on the physical plane. The knowing is God-given and natural. In these pages, I lay out the Ten Commandments of money. This is not a rah-rah up and at 'em, get your act together book. Instead, we look at the psychological aspects of aligning to money. But you also find the deeper metaphysical secrets of abundance laid out here, the inner game, as some call it. They are the subtleties known only to some, subtleties usually overlooked because they're not immediately obvious. We each have to search within to comprehend the ebb and flow of money in our lives. It's one of the great spiritual lessons of the Earth Plane. As our physical balance, love and compassion, interpersonal relationships, and the other experiences we collect in life, money is important. First, because obviously we have to eat. Second, because as divine spirits, we get a free body, and we're spiritually required to take that body around the Earth Plane. To collect life's experiences, mobility is important. It grants you the wherewithal to delve deep within yourself, to pull out your true power. From that personal power flows all the money that you'll ever need. At the end of your life, with all its triumphs and all its beauty, you're just a collection of memories you manage to acquire. Those memories make up your spiritual identity, your soul. Expressed as a sacred, infinite feeling, and that composite feeling, the story of your life, is the real you. It's eternal, for within it is the divine spark of God. Over the centuries, money has gotten a bad rap. It has been associated with corruption and the misuse of power. The perception grew that somehow the rich deprived the poor, and that if you became wealthy. You disconnected yourself from love, goodness, and the God Force. This is not necessarily so. I genuinely believe you can be rich and spiritual, and that with your abundance you can create love and compassion, using your wealth to help others strengthen themselves so that they might also accumulate money. Each one spreading his or her wealth around, so that everyone can collect the experiences they need. To become proficient in life's ways, to become fully transcendent and wise. In John Randolph Price's wonderful little volume, *The Abundance Book*, he cleverly reminds us that all the philosophies and religious systems of the ancients included the concept of self-sufficiency. That the ideas of harmony, peace, and abundance are common to all cultures. Price quotes nine excerpts from the Bible. 
abundance affirmations such as, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper, and thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth. Most of us don't remember these. We only remember money is the root of all evil. But the actual quotation is, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money of itself is a symbol of appreciation, a gesture of goodwill and compassion. It's only the negative emotions around money that are evil, greed, avarice, an obsession with power, and so on. Money is neutral. It's only a solidified form of energy, light. And light, of course, is also neutral. It can illuminate a church or cast shadows in a torture chamber. In the early Christian era, the church sought to control people. The ideas of self-sufficiency and the oneness of all things was edited out of the scriptures and religious teachings. Self-empowerment and independence were considered threats to religious authority and the feudal control of common people. But times have changed. Price points out in his booklet that the transcendental movement has, in the period of just over 100 years or so, reclaimed the concept of abundance, harmony, and the oneness of life. It began with Ralph Waldo Emerson and the early theosophists, and then on via Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian science, and those who formed the New Thought Movement, each one helping to re-establish the spirituality of self-empowerment. John Randolph Price points out that the idea of spiritual empowerment of the individual was carried from tentative beginnings to a greater and greater acceptance, finally emerging as a great spiritual light. This has been carried through the decades into this century by our important teachers like Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, Unity, Nona Brooks, divine science, and of course Ernest Holmes, religious science. It was these courageous forerunners who allowed the new age of enlightenment to take hold and new thought to pervade our modern societies. The ideas of self-sufficiency, abundance, and enlightenment are no longer threatening to many. People now realize that they are responsible for their own empowerment. They see that taking responsibility is a spiritual act, it allows each one the freedom to become more. For that to happen, people have to be brave, and they have to grasp the idea that they can control their lives. Accepting responsibility is an uncomfortable thing, for within that idea is the birth of the true individual. It's the only solution to our society's problems. Expecting someone else to fix our lives is silly. In the end, we need six billion individual fixes. In the past, we were manipulated and shamed into believing that the individual was not important, that all power and control over our lives should be handed over to the authorities, who would act as custodians of the collective good. Watching those characters manage the collective good for their own ends, often to the detriment of ordinary people, caused many to wonder if the philosophy of such disempowerment actually worked. The collective good became known, amusingly, I think, as the public interest, which turned out to be anything that suited the leaders of our spiritual, financial, and political status quo. The endless manipulation and control of our society was sold as an idea that is holy and good. After all, who could argue against the public interest? However, the idea that some brainless drone in a pinstripe suit on a massive power trip can tell you what color to paint your front door hasn't generated much interest from the general public. On the religious, spiritual front, we were sold the idea that we needed the authorities to intercede with God on our behalf. It has taken us over a thousand years to realize that this idea is rather silly and that we can have a little chat with God any time we like, without asking permission or hiring a spokesman. 
What's cool about the modern Christian churches is that they don't say you have to go through them to get to God. Instead, they teach people to empower themselves. Of course, the concept of taking responsibility and empowering yourself and granting yourself the freedom to guide your own spiritual destiny are radical ideas which are still taking shape. Look at our Western democracies. In theory, they are free. But in reality, what freedoms do we have? There are millions of rules that empower the authorities while milking the citizens and controlling every aspect of our lives. I often say you are free as long as you don't want to do anything. The minute you get a creative money-making idea, the political system jumps in with you. In true mafia style, they become your silent partners. You get the work and the risk, and they effortlessly get a large chunk of the reward while placing a hundred hurdles in your way. In Europe, where institutional control was invented for the most part, self-empowerment still isn't considered cool. The idea that you might want to make money, become abundant and direct your life is still regarded as brutal, egotistical and rather nasty. Anyone headed in such a direction will have to plough through endless negative waves of antagonistic opinion. They will have to be brave and face the manipulators, who heap shame and ridicule on anyone who seeks to break out of the straitjacket of the old mindset. Still, we haven't lost heart. Our time has come, and the rules of money are simple. It's not too hard to quietly thread your way through the morass of nonsense, to still make it and become free. Millions of energetic people have done it, in spite of the system. The new idea is here. Control is very old-fashioned, and our societies will gradually change as people come to see that the old system just doesn't work. I think the pioneer spirit of the Americans has allowed them to embrace the idea of individuality more readily. People there are more free. They're not so tied to the memory of ancient feudal systems. As a result, the new thought has gained ground in America, and individuals can strive for abundance, liberty, and mobility without feeling bad about it. People want to be free. They want to experience life to the full without having to subjugate themselves to restrictive institutional controls. It stands to reason. Yet even in America, a push-pull process has been going on for 50 years between the old-style forces of control and the new ideas that seek to liberate. The advantage Americans have is that they aren't subjected to the shame inflicted on ordinary Europeans who seek self-empowerment and wealth. That fact allowed progressive religious leaders like Ernest Holmes to form Christian churches which taught self-empowerment. These progressive modern churches have radically changed the old ideas. They, more than anything else, have given birth to the Age of Enlightenment. Chuck in the hippies, flower power, and the New Age movement, and suddenly great swathes of the population are thinking differently. Each one is pushing up against the thought police, those who seek to disempower and impoverish us while controlling, marginalizing, and ridiculing alternative ideas. John Randolph Price says, It is now estimated that at least 25% of America is involved in some measure with what is considered esoteric philosophy or new thought religion. And right in the mainstream of this consciousness is the truth that God is boundless wealth, and as expressions of the infinite, we have an abundant inheritance. In the time frame of history, these ideas are brand new, and yet they have swept America like wildfire and spread from there across the Western world. The concept of abundance and self-reliance is being given a new image. Teachers have carried out the new idea, saying it's okay for individuals to take control of their lives, and wealth when used sensibly, is spiritual, desirable, and above all, natural. That's not to say that poverty is necessarily unnatural, for some are born into difficult situations where they lack opportunity or education. Yet we can all rise, no matter how humble our origins, for money is energy, and generating energy requires nothing except enthusiasm. 
We should also remember that the inability to align to money in abundance is not a misfortune, nor is it necessarily bad luck or a sad karma that you've been lumbered with. More often than not, a lack of money is the result of errors in the fine-tuning of the buttons and knobs that make up the real you and your grand plan. The difference between the tramp and the millionaire is an almost imperceptible shift in consciousness and vitality. You too can make an upward shift simply and easily. You can learn to be more open and place yourself in the flow while learning the subtle laws of money and abundance so that life's opportunities come to you more naturally. It's all part of your spiritual journey. That is not to say that people who are very rich are necessarily very spiritual. Some are naturally adapted to the marketplace of life. However, in order to be a complete, whole, divine being with a bag full of memories and experiences, you may need to make the adjustments. So here are the Ten Commandments of Abundance, along with the underlying metaphysics and a brief discussion on what action you might take. I trust that I can remind you of the things you already know. Bring to your perception things that you may have missed and urge you to take certain actions so you can step into the prosperity and security which is a natural part of our human evolution. Yes, the rules and regulations of life can make things a bit harder, but if you have the knowledge, it becomes easy once more. By the end of this little book, I hope I will have convinced you of that. In addition, I hope that you will see that in some instances, compassion can be described as the manifestation of love in action, and that money is, in part, the fuel by which you express a greater compassion, by transcending a poor self-image, loving yourself, being there for others, and being grateful for the immense gift that has been bestowed upon you, the first and greatest gift you will ever receive, the gift of life. The law of abundance is natural and God-given. Concept. Since the beginning of time, philosophers, visionaries, and great spiritual leaders have talked about the natural abundance of our planet. The difference between being aware of our natural abundance and owning a hefty portion of it is one of the main spiritual lessons we come to the earth plane to learn. It is the art of controlling energy and manifesting your thoughts and ideas. We live in a 3D world that reflects back to us the energy, words, feelings and thoughts we put out. We're not all well versed in the manifestation technique, and it takes us time to learn it. But that of itself is a great blessing. Imagine a world where everything you thought, felt or said suddenly appeared in front of you. Sure, you could materialize a million dollars on the kitchen table in 30 seconds flat. But each time you had a disquiet or a fear, you would also have a monster standing up against the refrigerator trying to eat your lunch. We come into this sluggish 3D world with the blessing of a special protection. We can have thoughts and feelings that don't instantly materialize in front of our eyes, as they do in some of the spiritual dimensions I've experimented in via the out-of-body state. So the fact that you can't just materialize money may seem a hindrance, but it's also a part of a greater protection, which allows you to learn the art of manifestation without getting hurt in the process. It isn't hard to see the abundance of our planet. You only have to look at the fruit trees in the fall, the lushness of life. We know that money is not rare, and that abundance is natural. Buckminster Fuller calculated that if all the wealth of the world were divided equally among its citizens, each and every one of us would be a millionaire. It's natural, therefore, for everybody to be abundant. Our natural state is rich. The thing that gets in our way are the feelings of lack, despair, confusion, and the inability to master the marketplace of life. More often than not, we get in our own way by placing in our thinking obstacles detrimental ideas and strange resentments that we have to clamber over to get to the honeypot. I'm sure by the end of this book we will have sorted that out, and you'll remember what you already know, namely that life is energy, money is energy, and there's plenty of both.
start by reminding yourself that there's loads and loads of money around. Perhaps it sounds a bit silly, but you ought to begin every day by telling yourself there is no shortage of money. In fact, there are untold trillions of dollars, yen, pounds, d marks, and so on, swishing about more than you could ever spend. It's vital to understand that and to remember that there are millions of millionaires, lovely rich people to whom you can sell ideas, products, energy, and so become a millionaire yourself. We've been programmed by the system to believe that there are shortages and lack, and that uncertainty is normal. It is not. The idea is a psychological racket designed to control people and keep them in line by making them fearful. Don't buy it. Most people suffering from a limited mindset have no comprehension of just how much money there actually is available to anyone with the will. To step up and collect. Look at the ancient holy books. You will see they are full of hope, and positive expectancy, and abundant affirmations. In the Bible, for example, the words of Jesus are abundant. He lived in abundant times. There is no place in the Bible which says that Jesus wasn't making ends meet, even though Joseph and Mary were supposedly poor at the time of his birth. However, because we are taught a fear of power, it is naturally assumed that somehow money is evil, that rich people are dishonest and crooked, and that they feed upon little people. While the economic forces of our planet are certainly stacked in favour of the big institutions and governments, there is nothing stopping each one of us from gathering our fair share. It's hard to align to money if you think it's evil and nasty, but once you come to understand that money is neutral. That abundance is natural and spiritual. It's easy to see that having money does not necessarily deprive someone else. Many of the greatest teachers have given credence to this idea that abundance is spiritual, and that it is your feelings and your thoughts that create the abundance for you. In fact, if you are wealthy, more often than not, you will be disposing of your money commercially and charitably, supporting people around you. And adding to the overall velocity and flow of wealth, as I said elsewhere in my writings, there are trillions of dollars zipping about electronically on any given day. Those electronic signals are literally passing through your body right now, as are all the TV and radio signals that are in your local area. If you stop and think about the millions flowing through your hands right now, imagine making a slight flick of the wrist. In order to halt some of that loot in transit, so it sticks in the palm of your hand. A flick of the mind is faster than a flick of the wrist. Money is good, greed is not good. However, there's no reason why you can't be very rich, stinking rich, in fact, and still be extremely spiritual and a wonderfully generous person, aligned to the God Force with a huge heart and compassion for everyone you meet. Metaphysics. One of the inner concepts we have to grasp early on is that the whole of our reality exists in a wave-particle duality. I'm going to deal with this idea in detail in Law Number Five, but I'd like to mention it here in passing, as it is a key factor in understanding why some people are rich and others aren't. What the wave-particle duality means at a quantum level is that our supposedly solid reality. Is not actually solid at all. That everything exists in an oscillation or a hazy wave. It is ill-defined. This hazy wave condition remains the same until a particle is observed, whereupon it changes from being somewhere in a hazy state to being solid and existing in a defined place. The metaphysics of money and our ideas around money and abundance follow much the same path. As the laws of quantum physics, in order for money to become part of your life, it has to go from a hazy wave state of ideas, dreaming, wishing, yearning, and vague maybes, into a solid state: a dollar bill, credit in your bank account, a coin in your pocket. If you can convince yourself at the very deepest level of your being that there is no lack. 
no unfairness, no discrimination, that making money isn't hard, you suddenly open yourself to greater wealth. This is because you've collapsed your self-denial, your aversions and resentments, and you flip from the insecure, hazy wave state that says, where's the rent coming from, to the solid particle state. Suddenly you know it's coming because the check's in your hand. In collapsing your hazy wave money dysfunction, you open yourself to endless points of abundance. This simple click of the mind opens the door metaphysically. Remember, all points of abundance, points in our 3D reality where money is actually delivered, where transactions take place, are solid particle states, not hazy waves. So to make the manifestation process work for us, we have to put aside all our hazy wave ideas of lack. We have to become centered and aligned to the solid symbols of abundance. We have to know we can do it. When thinking about your money flow, say to yourself this, There is a way, and I will definitely find it. This affirmation works well for most all of life's little problems. Action. Take a little time over the next few days to stop and concentrate on things that you consider to be manifestations of abundance. Go to places where wealthy people hang out, look at the symbols of their wealth, and affirm the abundance of this earthly dimension is holy and good. Yes, money can be used for evil purposes, but in itself it has no energy. To make your feelings right, you've got to agree that abundance is natural. You can't look at abundance with anger or envy. You can't become abundant if you exclude yourself. So when you see a person in a limousine wearing fine clothes, if you say consciously or subconsciously, what a rat, that lifestyle's not for me, poverty is holy and good, you deny your potential. It isn't easy for most ordinary people to look at extreme manifestations of wealth and join in the idea. The ego is too racked with jealousy or inadequacy and judgment. We'll look at a palace and we'll say, that's not my kind of house. We'll see expensive things and say, that's far too much for me. To be abundant is simple, but first you have to be able to join with your feelings. It's not vital that you can instantly visualize yourself in the presidential suite of a five-star hotel, providing you don't deny yourself the possibility. In other words, you may say, I don't have to stay at the Grand Hotel, but it's certainly something I could take in my stride. It's certainly something that I'm pleased exists. Moreover, I'm thrilled for the people checking into the presidential suite right now. In this way, you switch from the negative affirmation that money is bad and poverty holy to the idea that money is neutral, that abundance is natural and God-given. So, Acknowledging abundance as a daily affirmation is a part of your disciplined action plan. Make a point of noticing the plum tree full of fruit. Gaze at fields of wheat. Meditate on the endless rows of vegetables at the supermarket. Accept the warmth of the sun as it rises each morning. And engage your childlike self in awe at the abundance of stars in the night sky. Now do this. Get a seven-day candle one of those votive candles in a glass jar, and place it in the southwest corner of your home. With the candle, you can place any sacred or power objects you may have. Next, you'll write a letter to the universe at large asking for a cash refund. I'll explain. In this lifetime, you've worked, and you've helped people, and you've loved and cared for them, and you've generated good energy, much of which you didn't get paid for because naturally you didn't expect to get paid for kindness. But you're entitled to a cash return for all that love and energy you put out. But only if you ask for it. So ask. Tell the universe, hey, I've done this and that, and I've worked diligently on myself, and I've helped others. And as money is only energy, and I've put out loads and loads of energy, I want a return of that energy a refund, and I want it in cash and right away, or anyway, as soon as possible. Add a sentence that says you love and believe in yourself, that you love and believe in others, that you know the world is abundant, and that you feel worthy and entitled to your cash refund. Light the candle 
and put the letter with it. Then each day visit your sacred spot and ponder on the imminent arrival of your refund. Do this until your refund appears. Restating your affirmations and replacing the candle each week for as long as is necessary. It's okay to leave these candles burning all the time. Just make sure it's in a safe place. Expect a surprise. You'll be amazed. When I did this exercise, I waited for a few weeks and then thirty thousand dollars dropped in my lap unexpectedly. Nice refund, I'm thinking. Chapter two, the law of flow. Concept. Everyone can get their head around the idea that abundance flows. We watch it daily, flowing and not flowing. Here's the subtle trick to being in the flow. But first, let me remind you that a positive attitude goes almost without saying. The more you moan and affirm you don't have enough money, the more it slips from your grasp. Maddening, really. But when it slips away, that of itself becomes a negative affirmation of how unfair. The system seems to be. Of course, it isn't unfair. It's just energy in motion, responding to feelings. To those that have, more shall be added, and to those who don't have, a chunk will be taken away. So the first rule of flow is to constantly tell your mind you are rich. There are many manifestations of wealth that aren't necessarily cash, love, friendship, nature, sweet sensations. Pleasing emotions, etc., etc. Rich is a way of viewing life. So tell yourself, I want to view the world with a kindly eye. I want to view it richly. Remember, your unconscious mind, the powerhouse of your soul, doesn't know if you're rich or not. If you tell it you're rich, it will accept that as gospel. You have to believe in luck and flow and goodness, even when cash-wise things might be bloody awful. Perhaps it goes against the grain, but if you see your affirmations as just that, affirmations, you can affirm your abundance and good fortune, even when things look a bit dodgy. The poorest person has things to be thankful for, so affirming your abundance is an act of gratitude and humility, as well as a way of keeping yourself in the flow. People get into trouble understanding flow because they can't tell the difference between effort and struggle, so they'll get an idea. And everything tells them it's not working, and yet they plug away, doggedly going through the agony of it all, because some place back there somewhere, someone told them that whacking their head against the wall was an honourable way of conducting themselves. Not quite so. Struggle causes a lot of pain, because it involves a lot of negative emotion. Struggle is also very hard work. All ideas that are holy and good and honest, ideas that serve humanity and yourself. Will have a positive energy of their own. When you head out to materialize a money-making plan, it will gather momentum. It's as if the universe at large leads you step by step, showing you the way. That's flow. You meet the right people. You sit in the right seat on the plane, and next to you is the very person you need to connect with. It's a wonderful thing watching flow in motion. We all know what it looks like. When it's working, the trick is to be able to pull back when things aren't flowing. As I said in my little book, "Life was never meant to be a struggle." Struggle is effort laced with emotion. As humans, we are required to exert effort to get things done. So, if you're cycling up a hill delivering loaves of bread, you will expend calories pedaling. Effort is natural. When one's energy expenditure gets wrapped in loads of negative emotion, that's when you flip to the unnatural from effort. To struggle, at that point you should pull back and ask yourself loads of simple questions, questions that highlight silliness. Of course, you need perseverance when times are tough, but perseverance mustn't trip you into negative emotion. That will destroy your dream real quick. So, if things aren't flowing, watch the signs very carefully. What little adjustments can you make to get things moving? Is your plan realistic? Do you have the wherewithal to pull it off? Are you missing some component? If you're missing a piece of the jigsaw, what does that piece look like? Is the piece inside you, or where will you get the bit you need? It's okay to go up the path a little way, only to discover it's not right for you. As long as you realize when things aren't working, and pull back. The trick is to evaluate and ask yourself: 
Is this a stupid idea or not? Am I going about it arse backwards or what? Do I need this suffering or is my suffering voluntary? Remember, it's not a defeat to pull back when things aren't right. You can always wait for things to change. The fool plugs away regardless of the signs. If you are aware, you'll pull back, or perhaps continue slowly forward, watching carefully, making adjustments as you go. Remember, don't be impatient. Things always take longer to materialize than you think they will. That's because our minds can move faster than the 3D reality in which we all exist. Also, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fail sometimes. See these as mini-seminars you attend to teach you the tricks of life. Of course, the main trick is to be flexible and easygoing and light-hearted, and to learn, learn, learn. Life's a seminar. We learn by stuffing it up. So be kind to yourself. Although flow often seems a form of magic, it actually stems initially from order and planning. It's much easier to experience a great good fortune when you're organized and ready and able to receive the abundance due to you. So ask yourself, am I ready? If someone shows up right now with my special opportunity, can I respond? Am I flexible? Can I move and go in an instant? Flow is energy in motion. So you have to become the embodiment of energy in motion, i.e. flexible, fluid, and fast on your feet. In passing, let's look at risk and reward. To make money, you will have to take risks, even if it's just your time on the line. The key to risk-taking is knowledge. For example, gambling is betting on an unknown outcome. Investing is betting on known possibilities. The difference is knowledge and the quality of your information. So when the amateur blackjack player is pitting his money on the run of the cards, he's gambling. But the professional card player has knowledge and additional information. He can count cards as they come past and make informed decisions about what is to happen next. He's not gambling. He's investing his money in a planned and reasonable way on what might seem to others a random outcome. His knowledge and ability change the random nature of the game into one of near certainty. He is not struggling, he's working, just as the croupier and cocktail waitress are working. So struggle can be avoided by collecting information, lots of it, learning and watching and topping up on your game of life. Moving through life with ability and knowledge, you go from gambling on life to investing in life. We all have to accept risk. Crossing the street is a risk, just one we're used to. The trick is to have enough information so that you're betting on outcomes that are almost certain. When the outcome isn't certain, you ought to design your involvement to ensure there's an easy and inexpensive escape route. Remember, as I've said before elsewhere, never go into anything without figuring out where the exit is. Never commit until you have to, and not until you have enough information. Try to make sure there's a back door to whatever commitment you make, unless, of course, you're very, very sure of your involvement. Metaphysics. The metaphysics of flow is easy to comprehend. You figure it with your feelings. Your feelings are enormously powerful. They are your extrasensory perception. The mind can deduce from what it already knows and guess at an outcome. And millions are lost every day using this intellectual guessing method. But your feelings are more accurate, for everything is energy. So any deal or investment or any involvement with others has an energy of its own. That is its thumbprint, if you like. Use your feelings to stay in the flow and keep away from trouble. Remember, if an idea feels wrong, it is wrong. That's not to say that you should trash a deal whenever you have a moment of disquiet. It's just to say, if suddenly there's an energy shift, you're in tune with your feelings. That shift will alert your feelings. When something feels odd, stop and notice and take stock. Your feelings guide you away from trouble. Half the trick to making money and being in flow 
is staying away from deals that don't work. It's the deals you walk away from that make you rich, as much as the successful deals. So put your feelings into everything. Meditate and become a satellite for your subtle feelings. The way to build up your sensitivity is to ask, ask, ask. Constantly refer back to your feelings to confirm your direction. If you're in a meeting, mentally reach out to the other people there and imagine your arm extending to touch them in the heart. Then mentally pull your arm back quickly while centering your mind, blanking it, and ask, How does this person feel? Edgy? Arrogant? Angry? Excited? Crooked? Safe? Loving? Kind? And so on. Your first impression will be the correct one. The litmus test to referring to your feelings should be used many times a day. Energy shifts constantly, so you'll want to be aware, especially when dealing with other people. How does this situation or person feel right now? How is it different from the way it felt last time I checked in? Is this deal I'm considering for real? Or has something changed? What's the upside? What's the downside? Is the downside far greater than the upside? Is the risk worth taking? Then ask yourself how you feel. Are you happy, comfortable flowing along, or is there something bothering you? Staying in the flow is only really a matter of staying close to your feelings. Struggle comes from a lack of awareness of self and from poor quality information. It is also compounded by the inability to turn back when the energy on a particular path peters out. Stay in the pocket, be aware, shift and change, and never get into anything you can't walk away from. Keep these rules and you will always be in the flow. Action. The action of flow is one of being alive and aware, ready to step forward fearlessly. You have to move towards your target, so do something each and every day that improves your situation and takes you closer to your dream. Sometimes that action may just be a simple thing that grants you more stability or more order, like perhaps you take a day out to tidy up your paperwork. Order of itself is a positive thing, is it not? Rarely do opportunities find you. Usually you have to be moving towards them. So heighten your ability to stay in the flow by heading out, talking to people, making contacts, stepping out from where it's safe and cozy, pushing against your comfort zones, reaching out. That's how the faucet of flow is turned on, by generating energy each day so that the universe at large can engage its magnificent laws and deliver to you even more energy. Try this. As well as moving towards your goals physically, through action, say, simultaneously clear a path on an inner level by blowing love and light out ahead of you. For example, if there's a person in your way, your boss, say, start every morning by sitting quietly and seeing her or him in your mind's eye. Bring them up close to you so you're almost eyeball to eyeball. Then breathe a long breath in and expel that breath out into their heart. No matter how antagonistic you may feel, send them light and love. Do that ceremoniously eleven times. They will change. You'll see. If you need them out of your way, don't wish them harm or evil. Just do this. After you've finished the eleven breaths, visualize them very small in the palm of your hand. Look down on them from above. Look at them standing there in your hand, an inch high, say. Then hold your hand up to your mouth and expel a short, sharp breath at them. Literally, blow them away, saying, I release you with love and light. Go in peace to your highest good, but go. Using this method, I got rid of a bothersome IRS tax agent who'd been harassing me for 18 months. A few days of this metaphysical hurricane, and he quit the service. The next bloke assigned to my case was so overworked and confused and stressed out that he closed my file with no more objections. If, say, you're off to an important meeting today, Breathe in the location if you know it. See it in your mind's eye if you've been there before. Or visualize the people. Or at worst, just imagine the meeting. Breathe in eleven times and see love and light to that location. 
Remember to tell your mind approximately what time the meeting will be. So say, I'm projecting this love and light to such and such a location for use between the hours of noon and two o'clock or whatever. Use your inner power equally with your outer strength. That inner power places good energy ahead of you. It gets rid of dodgy people and helps close the gap between you and money. That brings us to the next law of money, which is the law of distance. Chapter 3. The Law of Money and Distance Concept. In order to be abundant, we have to be close to money. Often, our relationship to money follows a push-pull, love-hate pattern similar to our other relationships. Sometimes a marriage or an interpersonal relationship may seem close on the surface, but in reality may be quite distant on an emotional level. It may be that one of the partners is pushing the other away, or because they're both pushing each other away, or because they are silently angry with each other. You have to look at the distance between you and money. Are you close to it and pulling it to you, or are you distanced from it and pushing it away? Naturally, the closer you are to money, the more likely you are to receive plenty of it. The law of distance breaks out into three distinct categories, emotional, intellectual, and physical distance. Let's talk about emotional distance first. If you have subconsciously established an emotional distance from money over the years, and if that distance is embedded deep in your mind, an anti-money veneer develops around you like a rhino's skin. It's a bubble of energy that disempowers you, denying you access to the green stuff. In a weird way, the anti-money veneer is trying to protect you from getting money. It establishes itself over the years. It's partly due to the anti-money feelings you hold, as discussed previously, but mostly it's sustained by what you feel about yourself. I'll deal with that in more detail when I talk about money and love in law number 10. But one example is self-hate. If you don't respect yourself, it's hard for people to grant you worth, so people will always undervalue you. If, say, you've always felt yourself to be an outcast, you may exclude yourself from the marketplace of life because you've excluded yourself socially. You may find you're always too late for the real money. You just miss the boat because your energy isn't inclusive enough. Not being able to include yourself, you find a subtle way to deny yourself the very thing you want. Meanwhile, you may still act out the chase trying for the deal but not quite making it. This way you can feel okay about your efforts. You can kid yourself you tried real hard, but deep down you had your inner sabotage program ready to kick in. It's the mind's way of falsely endorsing itself, saying, I tried hard, so I must be righteous and good, and I've only just missed. What bad luck! It's not my fault. You see yourself as an honourable struggler, denied through no fault of your own. Many believe that asking for money is unholy or wrong. Most won't even admit they want the money that they're asking for. Weird. Our society is pre-programmed to keep us all poor. We don't have to ask for oxygen, and money is a type of oxygen. You can't operate out of, if I don't breathe, will you love me? If I don't charge you, will you consider me holy and good and a nice person? Will you accept me? If asking is an issue for you, practice, practice, practice. Start at the bathroom mirror. Imagine your customers, boss, whoever, there in front of you. Imagine them asking you, how much do I owe you? And see yourself smiling as you pause to mentally double your prices. And listen while you say unashamedly, Thirty thousand dollars, thank you. See your hand out, waiting to receive your self-worth in the solid particle form. Once you realize that the emotional distance between you and money might have occurred because you acted against yourself in the past, disempowering your chances, establishing a distance between you and money, you can fairly easily click your mind and start including yourself. A good thing to do as part of your abundance affirmation is to include yourself in socially. Go to the street party. Show up at the dance. Attend church. Seek people out. 
and make it a discipline to include yourself. Remember, the more people you know, the easier it is to make money. People are the custodians of the planet's wealth. Knowing people is almost as good as cash in the bank. If you've created an emotional distance between you and money in the past, take a moment to ponder on what those emotions might be. Write them down and really look at them. See where they came from. Then realize that all you have to do is change your mind and act out that change by sidling up to where the moolah is. At the same time, you have to work on how the bubble of anti-money protection built up around you. Some of it is shame, as I said, but most of it is suppressed anger. Once you identify what feelings you've suppressed, you can start owning them. Once you realize you're angry, you can release it. Whack the cushions with a bat. Rant and scream and shout. Release the anger, saying, I'm angry because I'm not getting paid as much as I'm really worth. Let it go. You can change the situation later and put up your prices, but first you must release the emotion. You can't get a pay rise when you're angry. People will react to the negative energy and will resist you. They'll perceive consciously or subliminally that you don't love yourself. So why should they acknowledge you? They may even try to cut your money because they see you are devaluing yourself. Write down on a scrap of paper what it is that irritates you or frustrates you, the things that make you angry about money and the way it flows into your life. If you perceive that a certain person is blocking your access to money, include them on your list. Try to be honest with yourself. Telling yourself little fibs and being covert with yourself is partly how you establish the distance in the first place. Truth may be uncomfortable in the short term, but it's preferable to the long-term frustration, anger, and struggle that comes from a lack of awareness, especially if you have to sustain a lot of half-truths or lies. Say, for example, you tell yourself you're working hard, but you know that you're mostly doing busy work and avoiding the difficult stuff and that you're loading up in actions that look good but get you nothing. If this is so, you might get very pissed off by your lack of results, without being aware that you're acting as a terrorist against yourself, sabotaging your bottom line. Once you're honest, you can make adjustments. If, say, you've kidded yourself you're brilliant at what you do, when in fact your performance is sloppy and inferior, it limits your ability to get to the truth and really improve. Usually you'll claim that your lack is because of some outside force, luck or whatever. Most people you meet are fairly useless at what they do. You know that because you see it every day. Now this sloppiness of attitude, this laziness and lack of effort does not necessarily apply to you, but we can all evaluate and improve, can we not? On the other hand, you might have created an emotional distance between you and money because you've capped what you will give. So you might eke out your energy, limiting what you will provide or do for others, while expecting the universe at large to dollop great quantities of goodness upon you effortlessly. You have to be ready to serve and to give. You don't have to give money away necessarily, especially if you don't have much, but you do have to give of your heart. You have to be emotionally generous and willing and open, and not tight-assed and closed. If you expect the universe at large to increase your income ten times, it's hard for that to happen if your heart is closed and you are no bigger as a person than you were before. It's simple to comprehend. Big heart, big money. Little heart, little money. And lots of rip-offs and missed opportunities. Deals that go sour, ad infinitum. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, anyone can work that out. So closing the emotional distance means opening your heart, going past your resistance, stepping up to bat, and including yourself in the process of life. You have to be present and aware. You have to join, not avoid the issue. So be open, be ready, willing, limitless, agree to serve, subjugate your ego for the needs of others. But don't lose your sense of self. Be available, open and ready. But don't give yourself away either. You can hold on to a strong sense of self-worth and still serve others. 
It's a part of our great lesson in life. It's the act of going from a limited perspective to an infinite one that says money is everywhere. And the more open I am, the greater the potential for me to pull opportunities from everywhere. Many people resent money because they feel life hasn't been fair to them, that they've worked hard and haven't received as much as they should have, or that they are paid less than other people with inferior qualities to them. However, harboring these negative emotions only widens the gap between yourself and money. The other concept that fuels this emotional distance is the idea that someone ought to provide for you, that somehow the world owes you a living. The world does not owe you a living. You have to nurture and provide for yourself. This is the secret to closing the gap between you and money. Rather than blaming others, projecting your disquiet and lack, or your anger about money onto other people, begin to own your feelings. The intellectual distance between us and money usually results from a lack of understanding or knowledge. Sometimes we just don't know enough about what we're trying to achieve, or we're not well versed in the conditions of the marketplace, the ebb and flow of transactions. It boggles my mind the way many go into deals without knowing the people concerned, having little information to guide them, or they accept on face value the information presented without checking to see if it's accurate or not. That's not very clever. Another important thing is that many people never bother to learn their job or trade. Knowledge is power. The more knowledge, expertise and connections you have, the easier it is for you to make a profit at the game of your choice. So if you're a commodity trader, for example, and you specialize in pork bellies, you're in a worldwide casino that's betting on the ups and downs of pork belly prices. You should be up to date on what's happening at the piggery. You should be well connected with institutions in the trade and in the flow of information. And you should know how to get hold of information independently and quickly. It's difficult to compete against a casino that is better informed and better financed than you are. To survive in the commodities market, you need as much expertise as possible and a good dollop of luck. Most people lose. You're up against the pros. And although you might have a hunch and hit a winner from time to time, in the end, the odds are stacked against you, unless you know things that others don't know. They say the way to get a small fortune in commodities is to start with a very large fortune. In other words, the market is designed to part you from your money. Ask yourself, do I have enough information about the marketplace and or the particular area of creativity I want to be involved in? Am I a long way from the flow of information? an amateur in a professional's world, or, or am I ready and up to bat? Maybe all you need to experience real abundance is to improve your knowledge and close the intellectual distance. In passing, let me mention another thing that can cause intellectual distance between you and money. There are a lot of money snobs out there, people who believe money is beneath them, that it's not stylish or proper to go for the cash. They are elitists at heart. So they seek to elevate themselves above the concerns of common people by feigning a disregard for the things that concern ordinary folk, like earning a living and turning a buck. Sometimes this elitism is a social class thing. Sometimes it's a form of spiritual elitism, where a person feels themselves far too holy moly to be dealing with the trappings of the real world. Don't be a money snob. Unless, of course, you've inherited millions, then you can do what you like. The rest of us have to deal with life day to day, and money is a part of taking responsibility and accepting the system. You might as well enroll for the seminar and get it right, quick. That's the most pleasing way. It takes you to harmony and well-being and a stress-free existence via the shortest route. The matter of physical distance is simple to comprehend. Certain industries are located in certain places in the world. If you're a long way from where the action is, you may want to consider closing the gap. For example, if you want to make it big in movies, you more or less have got to be in New York or L.A. It's pointless being in Arkansas if you want to be in films. Closing the physical distance is a matter of showing up in the marketplace, becoming a face that people know, demonstrating your expertise, and getting into the loop where the movers and shakers are. 
People who could bestow great opportunities upon you, perhaps hire you or give your contract, aren't scouring the distant hills for talent. They're in the flow. The people they know and socialize with are also in the business. And they're communicating with those who made the effort to show up and declare themselves in the loop. So to make it, you have to go beyond your resistance, your shyness or inhibition, and head into the marketplace. It doesn't matter if you're not ready. If, say, you're a composer of pop music and you haven't got all your songs and demos together, you've still got to declare yourself in. It's a physical, emotional, intellectual declaration. You have to know what you're doing and be aware of which record companies are buying what acts, who's up and who's down, what's happening and what isn't. It's also a physical declaration of saying, I'm going to go past my shyness. I'm going to, go, I'm going to make the connections and enter the loop. Because knowing people is a very big part of closing in on my dream. I'm going to appear and play my songs in clubs. I'm going to put out demos. I'm going to become a commodity. Soon or later I'll be noticed and a great prize will descend upon me. Metaphysics. The metaphysics of distance are connected to the subtle bioelectric energy field, the etheric, that surrounds you. It is a map of your feelings. When you are a long way from money, emotionally, intellectually, or physically, your subtle energy will lean forward towards the few money sources that you do have. It will lean against people, begging for opportunities, begging for life to cut you some slack, or begging for a miracle to cover your phone bill. Your subtle energy becomes sloppy because you're leaning away from your power towards what you perceive as the lifeboat. When you're solid, when you're taking action, working on yourself, your theric is strong and powerful. It's not leaning up against life, trying to pillage it. It is standing straight, saying, I'm working on myself, collecting knowledge, processing my feelings, improving my performance. I've brought myself to the marketplace, and I am at peace with myself. I know money flows. I know fantastic opportunities are available to me. I don't have to lean against people. I can wait, watch, and pick my moment. I'm not whining and begging, globbing on to people like some sort of sticky goop, hoping they will elevate me or cut me a special deal. In the metaphysics of distance, you don't lean up against what you want, because in doing so, you push it away. Stand straight, nurture yourself, crown yourself king or queen, and work on things that are practical, things that endorse and help you. Action. It's a simple thing to sit in meditation and differentiate between your intellectual attitude to money and your deep inner feelings. Most people would like to have some more of it, but you have to ask yourself if there's a contradiction between what you say you want, hey, I want more abundance in my life, and what you actually feel. Closing the emotional distance is a matter of deciding or looking at what your deep inner core beliefs are about money. How will you emotionally get off the island of lack and row yourself over to the mainland where the market is bustling with activity and cash is flowing? In a moment of quiet, write down a list of those feelings and attitudes you have about abundance. Be aware of any non-actions that have distanced you from money. Try to discover your core beliefs. Who are you? What would make you happy? What's real and possible and fun? And what's just the ego's disquiet? Delve deep within and ponder. Pondering is good medicine. Discovering what you really want saves you endless confusion and wasted energy. Use your feelings to differentiate between vague yearnings of the ego and your deep innermost desires and needs. In this way, you will eliminate blocks and highlight any contradictions that may exist. For example, many would like to be millionaires, but subconsciously they know that making millions often takes lots of effort, and with that comes a lot of stress. So intellectually, they would like millions, but their inner truth is different. In effect, their subconscious protects them from something that sounds good to the ego, but would actually be a living nightmare. Looking at the distance between you and money teaches you things. Perhaps all you really need is a bit more money and a bit more security. 
Now, it may seem an odd thing to say, but you can't get security by earning money. Earning money involves activity, and all activity burns energy. So eventually that energy burnout makes you insecure. Low energy equals fear. High energy equals security. The only way you can increase security is to nurture yourself. All insecurity comes from the fear of collapse, the collapse of a situation, of your life, a business, whatever. So if you need more security, work on your body, be kind to yourself, sleep more, rest, hang out in nature, do nice things for yourself. No amount of money in the world can make you secure. Of course you can combine hard work with self-care, but you have to work at it. I was having dinner with Deepak Chopra recently. He's a successful author and lecturer, constantly jetting around the world. Yet he maintains balance by finding time to work out, no matter where he is, and by maintaining a very healthy diet. He told me that every three months he takes five days off on his own. He goes somewhere remote like a desert and stays there in silence. No phones, no people, nothing but him and silence. It's a brilliant idea. He rebuilds his energy by pulling back, and then he's ready to zip around for another three months. Get in touch with who you are. See what motivations are real, and which ones come just from the intellect and ego. Perhaps you don't really need the aggro of piles and piles of activity and responsibility. Perhaps all you need is a carefree life, with some good creativity, loads of friends, and plenty of fun and games. In the end, you must both take care of the inner spiritual self and satisfy the many needs of the outer self. It's a balancing act, like everything is a balancing act. If you look within and discover that making piles of money is your thing, but worry about the contradiction that may exist within you, don't despair. It's easy to change the subconscious. You just tell it that you've decided to change. You can easily rewrite your subconscious mind. You just keep telling it something different. You may have to do so over a period of days and weeks, but it's simple to agree to change your mind. It's also easy to see that abundance comes from closing all of the gaps. That idea of itself gives one a lot of hope and determination for the future. Of course, it's not just the emotional, intellectual and physical gaps between you and money. The real gap is always between what you think you want and what you actually want, deep down. Once you arrive at the truth, deep within, you've come home spiritually. You've returned to the source, where your divinity exists. In there you will find the truth, the meaning of life, and you'll see what it is that you want to do, what you want to offer the world in this lifetime. It's there in the deepest recesses that you find your connection to all things. From that stems a sense of immortality, and from that comes security. Bingo! Meanwhile, you could probably use more cash, so as a part of your action plan, do this. Get your checkbook out and write yourself a nice fat check, payable to you and post-dated. Then pin it up on your fridge or bulletin board and look at it from time to time. A friend of mine who opened a shop wrote herself a cheque for 10 million Australian dollars and post-dated it five years. Her shops did well, and she probably had a few million when a company proposed that she franchise her stores. The deal was worth about 7 million. The franchise deal came in with just a few days of the five years left. In the end, she decided that she was into creativity not accountants and lawyers, and all the stress that comes with a deal like that. So she didn't follow through. But she was satisfied, though, because the universe did provide for her check to be made good, even though she didn't take the potential seven million on offer, which would have given her a total of ten million. I'm sure she'll get to her ten million in the end. She'll just go about it in a less stressful way, a way that suits her creativity. Chapter 4. The Spiritual Law of Supply and Demand. Concept. Money is important because it is a symbol of your mastery and comprehension of life's great journey. 
You don't have to become rich, but you do have to have your money trips under control. Commercially, the law of supply and demand states that if there is more demand than supply, prices go up, and if there is an oversupply and less demand, prices go down. But there are other aspects to supply and demand which are less traditional. To make money, you have to deliver your energy in some form to satisfy a demand that is out there. And if what you are selling is energy, charisma, and enthusiasm, there is no competition. Because most others are selling things that are lifeless, loveless, and dull. So your stuff, your service, your creativity, whatever, will always be different, unique, and desirable, because you will imbue it with energy, the God force, love, and caring. It will excite people and bring them to life. It will carry within it the energy of the part of you that joined, the aspect of you that celebrates life. Laughs and is carefree, the part of you that honours humanity. It may just be a garden chair that you're selling, but your garden chair will radiate with light and love. It will be so lovely you could place it at the head of the round table, and no one would think it odd, as your chair is a beacon of light. Energy is easy to sell. Everyone is into it. It helps them feel special, looked after, and secure. Once you imbue your life, your products, and so on, with energy, you will see that the law of supply and demand no longer applies. It only relates to the tick-tock world we see around us. It does not apply once you understand the trick of projecting energy into your money-making activities. To properly comprehend this idea, you first have to make a subtle ego shift in your mind. You have to switch from focusing on yourself. What do I need? Who will supply my demands? What will I eat? Who will give me the things I want? And you have to concentrate instead on the needs of others. This doesn't mean that you have to become a charity worker or disempower yourself financially. It's more a way of saying your needs will be met once you find a way of projecting energy. And fulfilling somebody else's need—that is self-empowerment. Hoping someone will fix it for you is disempowerment, because a satisfactory outcome always lies beyond your control, subject to the whims of others. So switch your focus to how will I fulfill somebody else's needs today, and get paid in the process. There is no way of making money on this planet. Other than by fulfilling people's needs, it's just an ego shift. First, you concentrate on serving others, and in that way, you serve yourself. There are more than five billion people on this planet, and every day of the week, each one needs, say, a hundred different things. There are trillions of demands that need satisfying. So, rather than look at supply and demand from a position of insecurity and lack, you can see it from the other side of the coin. There is a perpetual oversupply of demand. If you can't give people one thing imbued with an energy that shines like crazy, you sure as hell can find something else they'll want. When you're selling energy, you're selling light, so your possibilities are infinite. What will you supply? The things that humans buy come in three categories: they buy services, knowledge, or products. Nothing else. You can raise your energy. You can change your consciousness. You can align to the divine abundance in all life, but when people are attracted to what you are, you have to have a knowledge, a service, or a product to sell them. Simple, really. By concentrating on what people need, you become abundant. When you look at the marketplace of life, isn't it true that so many products don't work? How many restaurants have you eaten in that are not clean or customer-oriented? How many businesses exist just to screw people? Rather than to love them and satisfy their needs, there are so many shoddy products and rip-off merchants who haven't clicked into how will I fulfill my customers' needs. Often, a customer's needs may just be an emotional need to talk to you about their life while you're selling them something. However, in order to get this supply and demand thing down right, you have to think in terms of energy, and you have to be clear what you will sell people.
Providing a service is not usually as profitable as selling knowledge or a product, because more often than not, services have to be delivered personally, and there's a limit to how many hours a day you can deliver the service, and at what price you can charge. Knowledge, on the other hand, is valuable and easily packaged. We live in an information age. There are hundreds of ways of packaging knowledge. What you deliver in the form of knowledge does not have to be way out. It just has to be presented concisely, inexpensively, perhaps, and with originality. If you have knowledge that people want, you can quickly become wealthy. If selling products is what appeals to you, think of products that you believe in, products which are worth the money. Ask yourself, can I put my heart and soul into the product? Can I be enthusiastic and really love this gizmo? Really serve my customers? So to sell things successfully, you have to subjugate your ego long enough to take people's money. This might sound a bit brutal, but in fact, it is a religious, spiritual idea. You subjugate your needs, your life, your aches and pains, your experiences, and listen to others. Watch their eyes, notice their body movements, relate to them. Ask them questions. Work out what does this person want. Then fulfill that want. Think about how you can improve what you do. Even if right now you work for somebody else, start by putting more energy in. If the place you work in is dull and lifeless, put energy in anyway. For by doing that, you will catapult yourself out of there to something better. If you're self-employed, think how you can make twenty improvements to your knowledge, service, or product. In the end, you're selling yourself, so you'll want that looking good. You need to offer love, kindness, and charisma. You'll want to be big-hearted, and right there, bushy-tailed and up to bat. So ask yourself: Are you eyeball to eyeball with life, ready to serve, or does some aspect of your personal agenda get in the way? If it does, put it to one side quick. Put it aside long enough to cash the check anyway. You can always visit your therapist after work. So offer beauty in an ugly world. Offer kindness where ego and greed predominate. Be accommodating and free-flowing when others are uptight, edgy, and stiff. It's so easy to understand. Take the product you're selling, and visualize the divine light shining upon you. Breathe that light into your being and breathe it out. Place the light into the thing you're selling. If you are a massage therapist, project light into your table and your little bottles of oil. Most of all, project light into your hands before each session, and of course during each session. If you're selling things on shelves, touch them regularly, move them about, make them come alive, give them energy. The little tins will be refreshed, even if they've been on the shelf for weeks and weeks. The more you touch and love the product, the more energy it has. The more likely it will belong to someone else in ten minutes' time. If you sell information, make it original, clear, and concise, and idiot-proof, so anyone can understand it. How often have you read instructions on how to access some information, say on the internet, and you wonder if it's written in Hindustani or ancient Sanskrit, or what language is it written in? Why is that? Because the person who wrote it. Was thinking of himself, not you. Just say it's a man this time. He lives in his own world in a basement with an IQ of a hundred and eighty. He hasn't seen daylight for many years, and the only human he ever talks to is a pizza delivery man. He couldn't give a stuff if you know your www dot coms or not. You have to think of others. There are loads of people out there who aren't very clever, but they have money. Will they understand what you are offering? Then again, there are others who are fairly bright, but they can't unscrew a little nut, as their expertise lies elsewhere. When I see the words "easy assembly" on a product, I immediately flee to the safety of the parking lot. I know if they say it's easy, I'm going to have to hire a rocket scientist to figure it out. So, what will you sell, and how will you make it irresistibly beautiful? In forcing yourself to supply a beautiful service, knowledge, or product by imbuing it with gentleness, love, and light. You are disciplining yourself to go from ego to spirit, from greed to abundance. 
from negative emotions to love. When you concentrate on people and you provide things for them, you're falling in love with them. Choose love to make your life abundant, and that love should be more or less unconditional, as best as you can manage anyway. Never forget that. Metaphysics. Inside your life's energy, personality and mind, is an oscillating molecule of infinite goodness, the divine light, the Christ consciousness. If you align to that infinity within you, you will always have energy. There's no limit to the amount of God force you can have. By concentrating on goodness, processing your shadow side, disciplining yourself beyond bad habits, and meditating on the light, you will become a light being. As you glow effortlessly with this energy, you will project that light into what you do. So you may not only be selling apples that are nutritious and tasty to eat, but apples that come with a little bit of your God force energy. You never have to compete once you infuse yourself and what you do with light. So your apples will outsell everybody else's. It's a matter of calling the light into your life. Put energy in. Visualize light going into the service you provide. Put light into your CD, musical tape, or the book you're packaging your knowledge in. Feel the manuscript bathed in light, or feel your product to be a part of the God force, albeit a tiny manifestation of such goodness. Remember, you are a teacher. You are helping people, making them feel safer, taking them from fear to love, from ignorance to knowledge. You are hauling them with a bag of apples from restriction to freedom. By mentally pushing these ideas into what you do, you are projecting the light out from yourself, and you're offering God. People will buy God-like apples a long time before they buy an ordinary apple. Once you have the God force in what you do, there's no more competition. You are no longer a victim of the vagaries of the market, the ups and downs of supply and demand. You're out on your own, miles ahead of the rest. I know a young man who opened a shop. It was minute, just two little rooms. The whole thing wasn't much bigger than the average kitchen. The shop sold candles, incense, aromatherapies, and so forth. Heaps of other places in the town did the same thing, but he was a bit different, so he wasn't in competition with the others. The young man was soft and kind and loving. People would come in, and he'd be right there for them. He'd talk to them, make them feel better, and they'd go out of his shop with a bottle of Lang Lang extract or something. I'm sure many didn't know the difference between Lang Lang and Ding a Ling, but it didn't matter because it felt safe and correct and nurturing. He had a little fountain in the doorway, and that felt nice. And the shop was spotless. The few shelves he had were always fully stocked and neat. Little signs explained things. And he explained things, and you could pop in for a remedy for your granny's arthritis. He couldn't fix it necessarily, but you'd wind up with a candle or a book or something which was imbued with tons and tons of love, and that would cheer your granny up. Her immune system would kick in a bit stronger, and she'd get a bit better. He sold love twelve hours a day, six days a week. He was humble and kind and soft-spoken, and if he had an ego. It certainly wasn't around during working hours. People loved him; they flocked to his shop. After several years of selling love in little packages, he sold the shop for over five hundred thousand dollars—an astounding price for a few hundred square feet of shop. He used the cash to make another investment, and he did the same love, love thing there. Now, eight years later, he's worth three to four million. And his company will soon go public. When it does, he'll receive an enormous refund, with a note from the God Force saying, "Here's twenty million bucks, dude. Thanks for dishing out all that love and sweetness in a dull grey world." Action. Get a piece of paper and write down the services, knowledge, or products you are familiar with, the things you are already doing. Then write another list of things you might be interested. In delivering to people, having honed down your lists, look at your products, services, and packaged information. Then analyze what other people have done in these fields. Ask yourself: Is this other product exciting?
Does it challenge? Does it inform? Does it teach people something? Does it enthuse them and make their life more comfortable? Does it help them to be sexier or more beautiful? What is in this product that has value, and how could it be improved? Perhaps you could take a very ordinary product that everybody is familiar with, and add a little something that makes it absolutely irresistible. Look at your commercial life so far. What have you sold? Let's say you've always sold your labour, and you're working for someone at present. What can you do to put more energy into the labour you provide? You might say, "I get paid the same amount of money whether I put more energy in or not." But this is not the point. If you energise yourself in your work, you'll find that one, the job becomes more fun to do; two, you are more likely to be promoted or given a raise; and three, you lift your energy so high that you go beyond the job. And hop perhaps to another corporation that pays you twice as much, and you do this by arriving a little earlier, staying a little later, improving your efficiency, and making an effort to relate emotionally to the people around you. It's good to practice putting energy in right now, no matter how dull the current situation. Later in life, that energy will become cash in the bank, or abundance, or wonderfulness of one kind or another. Under the metaphysical laws of supply and demand, you should not limit how much you're going to put out. You don't have to let the world use you, but you have to give because you want to receive. To start by giving, give of your attention and concentration, give of your love, give of your energy. Don't destroy yourself with negative feelings towards other people. If you can't love them, be neutral, be enthusiastic, be open, be up there for it. For in limiting yourself, you get stuck in one place on one salary for the rest of your life. As you agree to give as part of your action plan, and as you begin to look at how you can improve your service, knowledge, or product, it will take you to the next step. It carries you to a higher energy, a greater velocity, a larger salary, and bigger opportunities. It opens you to easy money. You'll find some money, or win some, or a great dollar bill moolah suddenly drops in your lap. Expect a payoff.